It is important that the church understand the difference between Jesus and God. Unless the church understands the difference between Jesus and God, they're going to be lost. And it's going to be easy to be uh, led astray. Easy to be deceived. Okay? And what I've discovered is a lot of times when you ask the question, the difference between Jesus and God, a lot of times people, um, they can't tell you the difference. And so what happens is it makes Jesus be God. Okay? Y'all know everybody with me on that? So I want to... And I think it's important that we establish that foundation before we go further. And I think a lot of times we assume certain things, um, but you should never assume because the assumptions can be, um, you know, can, I guess you'll, you'll land up in a, in a bad uh, place by assuming that, that people know, automatically know. Okay, so let me, let me I want to I wanna read a scripture, um, and, I, and I gave you guys a lot of scriptures, and you know um, that we... We uh, jump around um, a lot in our scriptures. So um, I've given you guys, I get people here have sheets. Uh, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 8. Okay. Uh, Genesis 1 says, and uh, of course, this is when, 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 when um, Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. Okay. Genesis 22 and 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So he told Abraham to offer Isaac as what type of sacrifice? Huh? A burnt offering. Okay, so that's going to be important going for, uh, forward. So remember that. Oh, this? Okay. Verse 3 says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Verse four. And Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the wood, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So Isaac asked him, okay, I'm seeing the, the wood and stuff. I see the fire, but where is the what? The lamb. Where's the lamb for the what type of offering? The burnt offering. For the burnt offering. And verse 8 says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they, so they went, both of them, together. Okay, and like I said, this is very important going forward because... What we're going to understand in this scripture is this is a type for Christ. So we're dealing with Abraham and Isaac. And God said that Isaac was his what? His only son. Right? Now we know that Isaac had another son by the name of Ishmael. Right. So why did not God, why did God refer to, and Ishmael is older than Isaac. So why did God refer to Isaac as Abraham's only son? Why? Why? Because Isaac was the promised seed. So when God, when, 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 when Abraham was told that he would have an, an heir, Abraham said he was old. He said that, that Sarah was old and they took it upon themselves and Sarah gave him um, 
uh, her handmaiden to wife and have a son with her. Okay? Y'all with me? Everybody with me? Okay. Okay, so let's see. So it's two things that's, that's here. We see only son. We see offering. But the type of offering that was to be offered was a what? A burnt offering. Now, let me, let me show you something. Because it's important to understand that uh, understand um, the requirements of the burnt offering. And see, what was happening is verse 8, right here by 22 and, 22 and 8, Abraham said something that was very important. He said, and Abraham said, after Isaac asked him the question, Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. You see that? Did y'all y'all did y'all catch that? He said, so Abraham, but think about it. Abraham was there to provide Isaac as the sacrifice. You see? Y'all understanding this, right? But we need to understand, before we go any further, we need to understand um, um, a burnt offering. So for this, we go to Leviticus 1. And it may not be on your paper, I'm sorry. But let's go to, uh, turn to Leviticus 1 and let me show you something. Leviticus 1. Leviticus 1, we're going to read just two verses, verses 3 and 4. And it's going to explain the, the burnt offering for us. Just put it down. Yeah. Yeah. Put it there for if someone comes late. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Leviticus 1, verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, talking about the burnt offering. Okay. Verse 3 says that if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it on his own voluntarily, his, uh, uh, of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand uh, upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement. So right here, we're understanding the purposes of the burnt offering. Okay, first of all, it had to be uh, without blemish. Okay, now this is physically it had to physically be, be without blemish. What does without blemish mean? Okay, in the natural, it means without a defect, without a spot. Okay? That's what it means in the natural. Okay? However, in the, 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 the spiritual um, meaning of it, it means without sin. Okay? And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking this a little bit slow, but I want you to understand what's going on. So it said that the burnt offering, and in verse 4, it says the purpose of it is to make atonement. Atonement for what? Atonement for sin. Okay? And it had to be an animal without blemish. And the purpose of it was for what? Atonement for sin. Y'all understand this? Okay, so therefore, when we back up to Genesis 22. Oh, whoa, well, whoa. Well. Let me see something here. Let's stop this from happening. Okay. All right. So therefore, when we back up to verse 22, and we understand that Abraham, that God was tempting Abraham and saying to sacrifice his only son Isaac for a burnt offering, we understand that what? By what we understand from the burnt offering, what, what do we know was impossible? It was impossible for Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. Why? Because he was not an animal. He was not without blemish. And it could not be, he could not make atonement by sacrificing his son. Are y'all understanding this? So this also lets us know that um, when you look at, when you look at the human sacrifices, why human sacrifices could not be possible. Okay. In the natural. Y'all with me? You're right. Okay. Okay. So let's 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 get into let's get into this. I have two objectives here. What I want to do is I want to um and basically we're going to distinguish uh, between God and Jesus. Okay. And I want to I want to say this: we are not denying who Jesus is and are his power and authority. Please understand that. Instead, we are arguing who the church has made him to be. Y'all understand that? Okay. 
And we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to address this God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. Okay? All right. Now, let me, let's start here. In, in 325 AD, there was a Council of Nicaea, July 4th, uh, 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea. And what happened is the Constantine um, was in charge of Rome. And basically what Constantine said was he, he did not understand the difference between God and Jesus. Okay. So what Constantine did is Constantine had a dream. All right. He had a dream that he would conquer uh, in the sign of the cross. Okay. So basically what Constantine was doing, he set the ball rolling to uh, establish Christianity as the, the, the religion of the state, basically. Okay. So, but however, Constantine did not understand the difference between who? God and Jesus. Y'all understanding this? I want y'all to pay attention. I want y'all to really pay attention, okay? So, basically what happened is Constantine assembled, um, I think it was 200 bishops. It was either 200 or 300 bishops from all over the Roman Empire to come together and explain who Christ was in relation to God. Y'all follow me? Okay? Because why? And why did he do that? Because he did not understand who Christ was in relation to God. And the, the amazing thing is, you know, that was 300 years after Christ um, was resurrected because it was in 325 A.D. So we're looking at roughly 300 years later after Christ was resurrected and he didn't understand. And the crazy thing is even now today, which is another 2000 years later, almost 2000 years later, uh, 17 um, hundred years later, we still do not understand. Y'all follow me? Y'all see this? And see why it's important to know? Because if you don't know, and my thing is this, if you do not know, you can't believe what you don't know. You're just saying that you believe. But if you don't know, how can you believe? Right. Okay? So that's very important to understand. Okay, so... My question is, so, you know, we, we came up later on, we came up with the word of Trinity. And, and let me back up for a second. So I want to I explain this to, to people about the Council of Nicaea. A lot of people say that the Council of Nicaea created Christ. They never created Christ. They just established who he was. You understand the difference? Because I want you to understand something. The church, there was no church in the Old Testament. The church uh, was born on the day of Pentecost after Christ was resurrected. That's when the church was born. Now, in order for there to be a bishop, a bishop is an office of the church. So in order for Constantine, 300 years later, to summons all of the bishop, these, these several hundred bishops, that means that they already existed. Y'all do y'all y'all understand that little small point? And this is not something that the, a non-believer would, would have a problem with. This is something that, I mean, that a believer would have a problem. This is something that, like, the atheists and non-believers have problems with because they don't understand what's going on. Okay? All right. So, let's go here. Um, that if you look throughout the Bible, you will, you will not see the word Trinity. Okay? You will not see the word Trinity. Anybody know why? Because they created the word Trinity. The, 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 the word Trinity was created later on. Okay, so it's not in the Bible. Okay, y'all understanding this? Um, y'all with me? And listen, if you have a question, please raise your hand so that we can address this. Okay? Now, it's important to um, know when we go to Matthew 28 and 19, it tells us that 28 and 19, Matthew 28 and 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We don't see in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So what am I saying? I understand where they get the Trinity concept from. However, when you name it God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's where you go off at. Because it, you have God, then you have the Son of God, and you have the Spirit of God. Okay, y'all with me? Y'all understand that? Okay, 
because and, and it's that little technical thing, because when we start, when we say God, the son, we're going to see some things that 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 is not going to align when we say God, the son. OK, so why people say Holy Trinity? I just told you why, because it was created in, and it was created later on and people accept it. Why do we the thing is, why do we accept a lot of things? Why do we say a lot of things? Why do we we talk? We've been talking about Christmas being the, the birthday of Christ. Why do we say that? Because somebody said it and we believed it. We just started repeating it. They was trying to come up with a way to explain, you know, when Jesus said, when you see me, you see the father. So they was trying to explain the concept and they came up with. You all right? Three right? and one. Mm -hmm. You all right? Three, God, one God and three persons are. You see, you understand? So what, basically what happened is, like I always say, in the absence of the knowledge of God, or in the absence of knowledge, people begin to give their opinion. You see, and, and the thing about when it comes down to the word of God, there's no need for you to give your opinion because God is thorough. God will always give you everything that you need. Okay, you understand that? So the only people that will offer their opinions about God is those that don't know. Because all you have to do is go to the scriptures and the scriptures will, will make it um, very plain for you. Okay? So let's, let's look at some of the, the, the characteristics of God. Okay? John 4, John 4 and 24 says that God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So right there, we know that God is a what? Spirit. God is a spirit. Okay. Numbers 23 and 19. Numbers 23 and 19 says what? God is not a man. Right? That he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. You understand it? So by him telling you that God is not a man that he should lie, it's telling you, okay, first of all, we understand that God is spirit. And second of all, we understand that God is not a man. Y'all following that? That should, be, that should make something very clear to you. He's not a man. God is spirit. God is not a man. Okay? We understand it? Y'all with me? Right? So also we understand that God, the, the Genesis 1 tells us in the beginning God created so God has no beginning, right? God cannot be created. Y'all follow me? Right? God cannot be created. God cannot grow. Y'all paying attention to this? He cannot be created. God cannot grow. Y'all understand it? And then God cannot die. Okay, because he's spirit. He cannot be created. He cannot grow. And he cannot die. die. Okay? Y'all understanding that? Y'all understand those three things? What are the three things? God cannot be created. created. He cannot grow. grow. And he cannot. Okay. All right. And we understand that Jesus did all three of those things, right? Okay? And, and what I, what I want to show you is, I want to show you a few things that, that, Every time that, that Jesus never said that he was God, right? right? Okay. We know him to be the son of God, the only begotten, right? Of the father, right? Now, when in Genesis, uh, in John 10 and 30, in John 10 and 30, he said, what? I and my father are one. Mm -hmm. Now, what is he talking about? Is he saying that we're the same person? No. Huh? No. Okay. Because how, how, how so, Solanda? You're saying that, that that's not what he's saying. No. So what, what is he saying? He's saying one in, in union. One in union, unity. Because we know that the, the church says that many members, one body. In Genesis, when, when we understand when God established marriage, he said that a man shall leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one. So it's about all about unity. We're not talking about quantity, number, division. Same accord, same spirit. You, you see what I'm saying? Y'all follow me? Y'all with me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we get to who is Jesus then? Let's, let's, let's break down Jesus. Let's establish who Jesus is. Because, like I said, I want you to keep in your mind 
that, that Genesis uh, 22. I want you to keep in your mind Genesis 22, 22 and 8, when, when, when Abraham told Isaac that uh, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay? I want you to understand that. Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so let's, let's, let's move on. Um, who is Jesus? John 1 and 1. John 1 and 1. Who is Jesus? And we, I, I think we, gonna, we may end up taking some time here. Okay? Because it says, in the beginning was the Word. Word. Okay? That's capital W. Okay? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was yeah. with and the word was with God and the word was God. Was God. So, and, and verse two said, in, in, the, begin, in, in the, the same in the beginning, and the same was in the beginning with God. Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand something. It said, in the beginning was the word. You see what I'm saying? So when we go back to the Old Testament, every time God spoke, that was his what? That was his word, right? Y'all pay attention to this. Every time God spoke, that was his his word. Okay, so did that mean that his word was separate from him? Huh? No. Y'all sure? Mm -hmm. I, I see some confused faces. Does that mean, can, his, can God's word be separate from him? Huh? Maybe my questions are, are confusing. When you begin to speak, when you begin to speak, okay, is that something different that comes out of your mouth? Huh? No, my word and me is one. Your word and you are one. Okay. Your word and you are one. There's no way of separating that. Right? So this is why it says that in, be, in the beginning, passant was the word. Right? And the word was with God. And the word was God. Y'all understand this? Mm -hmm. Y'all understanding this, right? Mm -hmm. But when you drop down to verse 14, it tells you something. John 1 and 14 says, and the word, again, here we go with that capital word, capital letter for word. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what we're seeing is when the word, we said that in the beginning, the word was with God. The word was God. Your words are a part of you, right? However, when the word was made flesh, what happened? A separation. There is separation. Y'all follow me? There is separation. I'm going to say it again. There is separation. So when, when did, did Jesus become Jesus? When did he separate from being the word of God to Jesus? When what? He became flesh. When he became flesh. Okay? So y'all understand that? So because God spoke him into existence, right? Mary was impregnated by the spirit of God, right? That's when Christ became flesh, when the word became flesh. Okay? Now... Here's the thing. When he became flesh, I want you to look at look at John, uh, John 1 and 12. John 1 and 12 says, but as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. OK. So what what I need you to understand is that he when he came as a man. Everybody that believed on him became the son of God because he was the son of God. One of the most one of the most popular um, one of the most popular scriptures is John three and sixteen, right? Which says what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's separation. You see what I'm saying? Because say that all and right here, it says that all that believed him, 
He gave them the power to become sons of God. So we're seeing clearly that there is a distinction between who? God and Jesus. Okay. Y'all understand? And, and, and real quick, I'll touch on the name right quick so we don't have a problem. Was his name Jesus? No, it was not. When we go back to the Old Testament, we, we, we see Yeshua, God with us. Okay? Yeshua, God is salvation. Okay? We understand that? So what happened is, from Yeshua, it was translated into to Greek, which became uh, Aesus. Okay? And then when we get to English, which is a new language, we get the letter J, and it became Jesus. Okay? Because when you look at Aesus, it kind of looks like Jesus. Okay? But the I and the Y, some kind of way, when we translate into, transliterate into English, it, they were kind of like synonymous or something like that. I don't know. Whatever. Okay? So y'all understand that his name was not Jesus. Okay? We understand that, right? Because I want to give y'all the truth. But see, this is why everything has to be spiritual. Okay? Y'all with me? Everybody with me, right? Okay, so we understand. So if I ask you the difference between God and Jesus, then what is your answer? Are they different? And that yes is based on what? God is not a man. Okay, y'all understand that? God is not a man. So we have to understand that. See, when we go back to Genesis 22, going back to that Genesis 22 again, 22 and 8, where he said that what? God will provide himself a lamb. Okay? For a burnt offering. What's the purpose of a burnt offering? Atonement for sin. Atonement for sin. To cover your sin. That's the purpose of a burnt offering. So this scripture, Genesis 22 and 8 says, God will provide himself a lamb that will be the atonement. Okay? Y'all understand this, right? Mm -hmm. Are y'all with me or is not anybody lost? Anybody confused? Because, see, this is all a part of, a part of understanding. This, all of this is a part of understanding the purpose of Jesus, who Jesus is, and the purpose why he came. So, according to Genesis 22, 8, what was the purpose of Christ coming? To be a burnt offering. To be a burnt offering. Everybody said, what's the purpose of Christ coming? To be a burnt offering. What is the purpose of Christ coming? To be a burnt offering. To be a burnt offering. And what's the purpose of a burnt offering? Atonement. Atone for sin. What is the purpose of a burnt offering? To atone for sin. And when we go back to when we go back to Leviticus one, it says that the 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 animal, the lamb that was offered as a burnt offering had to be without blemish. blemish. The lamb that was offered as a burnt uh offering had to be without blemish. Okay. And in the natural, a blemish means a what? Any type of defect. That's in the natural. But in the spiritual Without blemish means what? Sin. Without, Without sin. sin. So if, now, so let's understand this. So if the lamb has to be without blemish, without sin, so how did Jesus become the, the ultimate sacrifice? By being born to a virgin. Okay. Solana just said it, by being born of a virgin. So what exactly does that mean? Because a virgin represents purity. Okay? And we understand that every man born after Adam and Eve was born into what? Sin. sin. Why? Because where does sin lie? Where does sin lie? It's in the sea. Sin lies in the sea. So everybody that was born after Adam was born in what? Sin. Okay, so now when we look at, so that would mean that spiritually, everybody has what? Blemish. Everybody born has a what? A blemish. Everybody born has a what? A blemish. Okay, so watch this. So now let's look at, let's look at Christ. Okay, 
Mary was a virgin, so that means that she had not been with a man, so she was not defiled. So she was pure, right? Then let's look at his father, even though Joseph, we know the, the man Joseph to be his father. However, she was impregnated by what? The Holy Spirit. So that means that there was no seed of man in her. So that means on both sides, from the woman and from the man, he was pure. He was pure. No sin. He was without blemish. Are y'all understanding this? Y'all understanding this, right? And this is why he was able to be the sacrifice because what? He was without blemish. He was without sin. Y'all follow me? Mm. The Bible tells us that what? There was no sin in him. Are y'all understanding? Because this is important for us to understand what's going on. Why did Jesus come? How was he able to be the sacrifice? And that Genesis 22 and 8 made it very clear, something that a lot of times we speed bump over, we don't pay attention to, or whatever. However, it becomes real clear that God will provide for himself a lamb. And that's what God did. God provided for himself, what? A lamb. Y'all with me? And, and, and just remember I said that, I said a few things, that God cannot grow, uh, God cannot be born. Okay, we already know that, that he was born, okay, that Jesus was born. Now, I want to show you about growing. Luke, go to Luke 2 and 52, just to, just to throw some things out there for you so you can see that he grew. Luke 2 and 52 says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So that means that he grew. Okay? And we understand that God cannot what? So that means that Jesus is not what? He's not God. All right. Let's go to, um, because I, I want you to understand something. Since he was the, the son of God, right? Everything about the Bible tells you that he was the what? Son of God. That he was the son of God. So how do we make him be God? Let me, let me just ask that question. How do we make him be God? How do we make him be God if everything about the Bible tells us that he was the son? Huh? Because everybody wanted to be the same person. Everybody thinks he's the same. He's the same. Mm hmm Trying to um, explain things without revelation knowledge. That's right. We're trying to explain things without revelation knowledge. So that means without revelation knowledge means that we're trying to explain things in the natural. We're trying to make sense of something spiritual in the natural. We can't be done. Because why? The natural man, your knowledge is limited. You understand that? However, the spiritual supersedes all. We explain it from what we could see and what we can't see with like faith. We mm -hmm. try to explain it from us. You know what I'm saying? Like when things happen, you wonder how did it happen. We think from the uh, corner mind, you mm -hmm. be like, there's no way. I can't see this. But it happens. Mm -hmm. Like when there's a baby that fell in a hole. That time, now we always talk about that. Mm -hmm. I feel a um, natural mind would be like, how did she get hit in the car, flipped out, and end up in a tunnel? Like, you can't see that. Mm -hmm. But it happens. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm looking at your, your scripture that you provided, uh, uh, Teresa. That's, and guess what? That, that scripture is, is very profound because it says that, uh, is, it, is, it, is that Isaiah? Mm -hmm. um, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and he shall be called all of these things. You see what I'm saying? Because this is what his name meant. This is who he was. However, he was not God. Right, but he embodied. But he embodied everything that God, God is. is. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's good. And see, that's why you say when you see me, you see the Father. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? My word would not return unto me void. Y'all understand that? Because everything that God sent him to do, he did it. He accomplished it all. Because remember, he said that I don't have a doctrine. When they asked him about his doctrine, he said, I don't have a doctrine. The only thing that I say is that of he who sent me. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So if they were talking to the man saying that, okay, well, tell us about your doctrine. And the man is telling them, I don't have a doctrine. I'm coming. I'm here on assignment. Okay, y'all understanding that? Yeah, thank you, I, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so that's, that's very important. But one thing that is very enlightening is the fact that everybody that believes on him becomes who? He's the son of God. 
And every that everybody that believe on him becomes who? Sons of God. Sons of God. Y'all understanding this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So watch this. Um, First Timothy two and five tells us something because we need to understand what's going on here. Because I don't want to ever ask the question again about the difference between God and Jesus or ask you, is Jesus God? And y'all tell me that that Jesus is God. OK, y'all understand this. So that's why I took this time. I want to clear this up. I want to clear this up so we can have an understanding that Jesus was sent to what to be what? For atonement. Mm -hmm. He was the ultimate sacrifice for atonement. OK, so watch this. First uh, Timothy two and five. For there is one God. Uh huh. I I'm going to say that again. For there is what? One God. One God. For there is how many gods? One. One God. So if you have Jesus and God. And if Jesus is God, wouldn't that make two gods? Yes. Uh huh. But since he's seated on the right hand of the father, that's two different individuals. Mm -hmm. That's two entities, right? But this tells you that what? There is one God and one mediator between God and men. Oh, so wait a minute. So that means that since he's at the right hand of the Father, he's the mediator between who? God, God and men. Y'all understanding this? Mm -hmm. the, and it says, now, now pay attention to this. Because it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And then it says what? It says what? It says the what? The man. Christ Jesus. Okay. So that's telling you that Jesus was a what? Man. And in the Old Testament, it told us that God is not a man. Okay. Are y'all understanding this? Is this making sense? I want this to be clear. That's right. And, and what, what Control said, that's why we pray. We've got to pray to the, to the Father and go through the Son. Because you always pray to God. But in the name of Jesus. Y'all understand that? You always pray to God in the name of Jesus. Y'all with me? This is why we, when we pray, we seal it with in the name of Jesus. In Jesus name we pray. OK, because he's that mediator. OK, y'all with me, right? Colossians 1 and 15. Colossians 1 and 15 says that talking about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God? Who is the what? The, the image. image of the invisible God. The what? First. Oh born of every creature the first what the first born of every creature so that means that guess what that that you know what let's let's read it in verse 18 verse 18 says that what and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the first born of the dead that in all things that he might have the preeminence you see what i'm saying so is that he's the first born of every creature and then he says he's the first born of the dead so that means he was created with preeminence, right? So that means that when we go back to Genesis, everybody was created in the image of who? Christ. Are y'all understanding this? Mm -hmm. He's the firstborn of every creature, and he is the firstborn of the dead. He has preeminence. Okay? So you know what? And I, and I know this is not on the paper. Uh, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews, um, uh, Hebrews 1, I think. Go to Hebrews 1. I, I want to I wanna read something to you because it says that the, the, the difference is that we have to understand that, no, Jesus is not God, but he was created with preeminence. Okay? He's not God, but he was created with preeminence. Okay? Now, let's, let's take a look at that preeminence so we can understand that he is special. Because we know, for one, he was special because, guess what? He didn't have, the, the, he didn't have the, the seed of man. He was born without sin. So that alone makes him above everything and everyone. Hebrews that part alone. One. Hebrews 1, and we're going to drop down to, um, no, you know what? I'll, I'll just read 1 through 6. Hebrews 1 through 6. But I really want to focus on 4 through 6. 
Hebrews 1. Our focus is 4 through 6, but I'm going to just read uh, from verse 1 so we could just have an understanding of everything. Okay, we're talking about Christ. God, who at sundry times and in, the, in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. So he appointed heir of all things, right? Mm -hmm. By whom also he made the worlds. So it's saying that, okay, Christ also made everything. Because, and see, this is where we, we sometimes it gets confusing. How did he make everything? Because he was what? In the beginning was the word. word. Because everything was created by the word of God. So how did Christ make everything? Because he was the word of God. He was the word made flesh. Is that, is that confusing or y'all understand that? Evelyn, you understand that? Okay, so how did Christ create everything? Because what? See, we, 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 we got to understand this. How did Christ create everything? Because he was the what? The word of God. He was the word of God. And God spoke everything into existence. Okay, verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, and that word bright means special, there's only two uh, people in the Bible uh, and that was bright, and that's going to be Christ and Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two bright individuals. It's a brilliant creation. Okay? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sin. See, that's the atonement. Mm -hmm. Okay? When he purged our sin, that was the atonement. But after he purged our sin, it says he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Mm -hmm. So after he purged our sin, then he seated on the right hand of the father. Okay. Watch this because this, this is what we're focusing on. Four through six being made so much better than who? The angels mm -hmm. being made so much better than the angels. Who was made so much better than the angels? We're talking about Christ. Mm -hmm. As he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than there. So his name is above all names. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this is the way that God established it. He was created with preeminence. He was a created above all. You see? Verse 5 says, For Unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. He said, which angel did he say that to? He didn't. Verse six. And again, when he bring it in the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God, what? Worship him. Worship him. So this is why he receives that worship, because he was created to receive it. Everything was made. Everything was made by him and for him. And see, I don't want to confuse you, but this is why when you go to the Old Testament, and, and it's called a, a theophany. A theophany is the appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And one theophany is we understand when, 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 when Sodom and Gomorrah was getting ready to be destroyed. The three beings that came to Abraham and Abraham went out to them and he fell down and worshiped. He was worshiping Christ. Because we understand throughout the Bible, you don't worship an angel. Mm -hmm. Again, in Joshua, when Joshua um, was standing and he looked and saw the, the man there and he said, who are, are, the, are you for us or for our adversary? And the man responded. Neither, but as captain of the, the Lord's host, am I come? And he told him, take off your shoes for where you stand is holy ground. And Joshua fell down and worshipped him. Right. And then we could go into Revelation when um, John went That's right. down to worship the angels and they told him, no. That's right. Don't worship, don't worship me. me. Mm -hmm. Because angels don't receive worship. Right. Is this clear to y'all? Does anybody have any questions about this? Because this is, listen. This is very important for your, your walk that you understand this. Why he received worship if, if he was the man? Because he was created to receive worship. He was created above all angels. However, for the purpose of dying, he had to be 
and he had to be lower than them. And this is since why there's the dual nation, uh, the dual nature, 100% God, 100% man. Y'all with me? Y'all follow that? Y'all following this, right? Is this making sense? You got a question? Okay, because if you got a question, I want you to, to ask that question because I don't want you to leave here not understanding what's going on. Okay, so Jesus was created with what? Preeminence. Okay. Y'all understand this? Watch this. And another thing to hit this point home, when we, when we go to Matthew 16, when he began to have this conversation with the disciples, that who, when he asked the disciples who he was. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Beginning at verse 13, he says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Huh? Because remember, not, 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 listen to what Jesus asked. Jesus said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Okay, hold on to that. Hold on to that for a second. Because let's go back to, let's go back to, um, let's go back to Numbers 23 and 19. Remember Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the what? The son of man. The son of man, that he should repent. That's good, Derek. I hope you're seeing this distinction. I hope you're seeing this distinction. But Jesus, when he asked the disciples, he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So Jesus identified himself as the what? Son of man. Son of man. Mm -hmm. Right? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Right? And Simon Peter answered, let me stop. Let me stop and say something to you. Because he, here's, the, here's the thing. Let me explain what was happening to you. Jesus is asking a spiritual question to a bunch of carnal individuals. Mm -hmm. Are you understanding? Jesus is asking a spiritual question to a bunch of carnal individuals. He's asking a spiritual question in the flesh. Okay? Are y'all understanding this? Jesus is asking what type of question? A spiritual question. A spiritual question to whom? Carnal people. Carnal people. So he's asking a spiritual question to some non-spiritual people. Okay? That's what Jesus was doing. Asking a spiritual question to some non-spiritual people. Okay. And watch this, verse 16, 16 and 16 says, Matthew 16 and 16 says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the what? The Son, the Son of, of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Borjona, son of Simon, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee. But my father, which is in heaven. So Jesus said that, guess what? You're answering my question, but guess what? You didn't get it from the natural. Flesh and blood had not revealed it to you. Flesh and blood could not reveal it to you. You see? Y'all seeing this? He says, but what? My father, which is in heaven. You see that? Once again, we're seeing the distinction between Jesus and the father. But we're seeing that Jesus is saying that, okay, Here's where we're starting to understand revelation knowledge. That's what this is, this is talking about, revelation knowledge. Because he's saying that flesh and blood had not re uh, revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. So what Jesus is saying is that what he explained in this moment is that without revelation knowledge, none of this will make sense. And see, this is why God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You got to use that spirit of God, which he has deposited in you. When you accept Christ, you receive the spirit of God. When you believe on the son, you receive the spirit of God. Y'all understand this, right? Y'all with me? Okay. Notice Jesus never said that he was God. 
I want you to understand it. When he introduced himself, he introduced himself. He said right there, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And then when Peter said, um, you are, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, he says that, bingo, you're absolutely correct. You're the son of God. So again, why do we try to make Jesus be God? See? You know why? Because it gets confusing. You know what? He's God. You see? Y'all follow me? Uh, huh? What you was about to say? It can't be done. That's where we go wrong. You know what I'm saying? Well, here's, here's where... Yeah, and I think what it is, they try to reduce it. They try to reduce the spiritual to be carnal. You see what I'm saying? And that's where the problem comes in at. Because, see, think about this. Um, um, Jesus walked on water. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a, a spiritual intervention. This is a spiritual happening. In the carnal, in the flesh, try to walk on water and see what happened to you. Right. You see what I'm saying? So what they do, if you never see, so those that are in the carnal are going to say man can't walk on water. Therefore, I don't believe that. Because they're carnal individuals. But when you tap into the spiritual, you say that, guess what? All things are possible with God. Oh, it can be done. And the thing is, we know of some things that we know it was nobody but God that did it. You see what I'm saying? But when you try to reduce it to being in the natural, it doesn't make sense. And that's the thing. Um what was going on in those days like jesus he forgave sin and the pharisees and the sadducees knew that man couldn't forgive sin only god can. Mm -hmm. and um and he calls the lame the walk you know all mm -hmm. type of things that happen and they just say he must be god is you know as we read it and we knowing that mm -hmm. only god can do it so he must be god right you know? but they didn't understand what the authority and, and his purpose. because they didn't have the authority Yes. They didn't understand his purpose. You see what I'm saying? And see, this is why it's very important. Because after Christ left, then he gave that power and authority to who? Us. Ah, see? That's why it's so important. Like Teresa just wrote that Jesus is God in the flesh, but Colossians 1 and 15, who is the image of? He's the image of the mm -hmm. invisible God. He's not God. Right. Right. But he was the closest thing. And let, let me tell you something. It's like this. If we are, I want you to understand, if we are the ambassadors of Christ, then guess what? When we show up yeah, in his name, sure. in his name yes. then guess what? I'm acting according to, to Christ on his behalf. So right. guess what? In that moment, I'm doing the same thing that Christ would have done right. because I'm his ambassador. So I'll be Christ in the flesh in that moment. Yes. You, 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 you know what I'm saying? That I don't want that to be crazy. Mm -mm. You see what I'm saying? See, this is why even when we, we're praying for people, and, and I've heard people pray and say, you know, send Jesus into the hospital. No, 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 no. You ain't sending Jesus nowhere. Jesus told you to go into the hospital. How you sending Jesus when Jesus said, all of these things and greater shall you do? I've given you this power and authority to do this. Right. So therefore, do it. All you do is you pray to God for the strength. But you do it. You see this? Y'all understand this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, ver, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 tells us that, For he had made him to be sent for us. For he had made him. Who is the he that made him? We're talking about God created him, Christ, to be sent for us. Who knew no sin. He had no sin in him. Right. That we might be made the righteous of God in him. Remember, all that accepted him, he gave them the power to become the what? Sons, sons of God. Sons of God. So what what second Corinthians five and twenty one is saying that, OK, he was created without sin, but to be sin for us. And what does the, what does this mean? Because you have to understand that unless he came in the flesh, he could not have been killed. He could not have been sacrificed unless he came in the flesh. 
Y'all follow this? Because God has, there's no sin in God. Y'all understand this? However, when he created Christ without sin, he created him without sin to become sin. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to y'all? Mm -hmm. Y'all follow me? Y'all with me? Okay. Um, I, I, want, I, I, I just want this to, I want you to understand what's going on because this is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of life and death. And if you don't understand what's going on here, guess what? You can't spread this word. You can't give him to nobody. And you can't believe it. You can't believe it. You don't believe it. Yes. You see what I'm saying? And you can't walk in the authority that you have if you don't understand this. Y'all see this? Mm -hmm. Y'all with me, right? Y'all with me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, watch this. Because, like I said, I've already shown you the difference between God and Christ, right? Right? I showed you that there, there was a difference. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All of that was true in the beginning because he was the spoken Word of God. He was the, the Word of God mm -hmm. in the beginning. But then it tells us that the Word that was spoken became flesh. So when the word that was spoken became flesh, now it is no longer God. Now he became that man. Y'all follow me? Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Y'all with me, right? Okay. I don't want you to, Evelyn, you, you, you got me? You understand that? You with me? Okay. So watch this. Because here's something that, that is very uh, amazing too that we kind of overlook. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at, from verse 24 to 28. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28. Let me show you something which also hammers home. Because these last two points I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a give you are going to really hammer home that, that Jesus is not God. Okay? He's the Son of God. He's always said that he was the son of God, not God. Because making him be God creates a second God. There is only one God. Now watch this. First Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 24, it says, then cometh the, what? End. end. Then cometh the end. So this is telling us that something is about to happen in the what? End. In the end. Okay. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, God even the father so that means that there's somebody that's going to give the kingdom to god to the father when he shall have what put down, put down all rule and authority rule and authority and power mm. i'm gonna read that again first corinthians 15 24 says then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to god even the father when he shall have put down all rule and Authority, all rule and all authority and all power. So let's pause right there. This is saying because this is talking about Christ and saying that in the end, he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. Mm -hmm. To God. Okay. And he's going to put down all rule and authority and power. Are y'all seeing this? Because here's what you need to understand, too. Let me explain something. Let's put a pause there because I should have covered this earlier. I didn't. So let me give it to you now. What was Jesus' promise? Does anybody know? What was Jesus' promise for his obedience to God? Anybody know the, uh, the Davidic promise? That the... the uh, that, that David's lineage will be established forever. Anybody remember that? It says that Jesus is going to sit on the throne of... No. Huh? Right. Of his father who? No. David. No. Oh. David. That's, that's what he was promised. Mm -hmm. Because it tells us that he's going to reign for how many years? Yeah. What is the, millenn the millennium reign? Millennial reign. That Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. See, because right now he's not reigning. He's seated at the right, right hand of the Father. But it tells you that he will reign for a thousand years. 
Right? Y'all with me? Are y'all understanding this? Right? Uh uh-uh. uh. He has to reign on his own throne. Right. He's not. How can he take God's place? I want you to think about how can he take God's place? Nobody can take God's place because, after all, that's what the enemy tried to do. That's what Satan, Lucifer, tried to take his place, remember? You see how that worked out? Because, you, because there's only one God. God will always be God. There's none but him. But his, but Christ came on earth. Huh? Christ came on earth. Uh-huh. That's right. Christ's kingdom is going to be what? On earth. I'm looking for your, your internet to uh, pull this up. Christ's kingdom is going to uh, be on earth. Right? Everybody agree with that? Revelation 20 and, and 4. That's what it is. Revelation 20 and 4. And it says, And I saw thrones... And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and what reigned with Christ a thousand years. Are y'all seeing that? Because that's what that's what he's promised. He's promised to reign for a thousand years. Y'all see that? Are y'all seeing this? Y'all show. Sure? Okay. Because I want you to understand that this is what Christ was promised. Christ was promised to, to have his own throne, and he's gonna reign for a thousand years. Well, you got to understand when the new heaven and the new earth come down, this is going to be in because this this world here is temporary. So we're talking about after everything is over, because this shall perish. The new heaven and the new earth that's going to come down will be forever. OK, Luke 1 and 32. Go to Luke 1 and 32 right quick for me. I, I, it ain't on the paper. You, oh. y'all, don't, um, y'all, y'all turn to Luke 1 and 32 right quick. So you can see this uh, Levitic promise, the Davidic promise. Um, Luke 1 and 32. Luke 1 and 32. Luke 1 and 32. And what Luke 1 and 32 says is he shall be great. Talking about Christ. And he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. his father David. That is the Davidic promise. That's what God promised uh, David that his throne would be forever. Uh, so y'all understand that? Said, well. That was one in thirty-two. Y'all understand that? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so when we go back to First Corinthians fifteen, beginning at verse twenty-four, it says that in the end coming, when he shall have de- delivered up the kingdom to God. <clears throat> even the father when he shall have put down all rule authority and power because what i'm trying to get you to see so what is christ going to be in that moment when he give all of that up watch this 25 for he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet does that sound familiar does that sound familiar? he shall reign until he put all enemies under his feet because, see, this is Genesis 3 and 14, I believe, when he, when he told the serpent that, uh, his, that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the, the, the head of the seed of the, 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 uh, the serpent. Y'all get this? So it's saying right here, for he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 27, for he had put all things under his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. In verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Y'all see this? 
So watch this. Because in that moment, Christ is going to put down his power and authority. And guess who Christ becomes when he put down that power and authority? He's the firstborn of many brethren. brethren. I hope that doesn't mess you up. Does that mess anybody up? So we understand that Christ was created to be what? The atonement. The atonement for sin. To cover for sin. Because of sin, it made way for Christ to come. Christ came to be the atonement for sin, to restore us back to where we needed to be in God. Okay? He was without blemish, without sin. He was pure on both sides, on, on the side of Mary, who was a virgin, and he had no father, no earthly father. So therefore, he was without sin, without blemish. This is what made him be the, the sacrifice. Now, and I want, and, and this last thing I want to give you um, as well. One last thing I want to give you, which is um, we know that the, the, the Bible says that the, the only thing that you will not be forgiven for is what? Blasphemy, Blasphemy against, against the Holy Spirit. The only thing that the Bible says you, will, you can never be uh, forgiven for is what? Blasphemy. Against what? The only thing that the Bible says you will never be forgiven for is blasphemy. Okay, blasphemy against the. Holy Spirit. I'm I'm asking y'all because I want y'all to say it. The well, hold on. The only thing that you cannot be forgiven for is what? Blasphemy. Against the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me. Okay, let me. Let me. Let me pause. So why I say why people say suicide? Okay, let's answer that question. Can anybody answer that question? Can you be forgiven for suicide? You need this. Hmm? Somebody, anybody? Can you be forgiven for suicide? Why or why not? The Bible says no repentance from the grave. Hmm. Did you hear that? Say it again. There's no repentance from the grave. Okay, so the thing is, there's no repentance from the grave. Okay? Because, see, what you have to understand is in order to be forgiven for something, you have to come out on the other side of it and turn around and look and say what? Forgive me. You have to turn around from it and say, forgive me. You have to repent for it. So, of course, if you kill yourself, then how are you going to repent for it? You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, because, see, and, and let me tell you, you know why the Bible didn't need to say that? Tell me why the Bible didn't need to tell you that. And what was it? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Kill. So he didn't come. He didn't need to come back and, and tell you again that who who you're killing, killing people versus killing yourself, because life is in the what? In the blood. Life is in the blood. Are y'all understand that? Did Did everybody understand it? Are y'all understanding this? Yes. Life is in the what? So anybody that takes life is what? What are they doing? They're playing God. They're playing God. And see, this is why it can't be done. You see that? So watch this. When we go to, uh, when we go to Matthew 12, um, 31. Oh, Tanya says, so then why do people say once you're saved, you're always saved? Become, because it comes from the, the ignorance of, of what the word of God says. That's why. That's what it comes from. Um, and and I'm going to pull up a scripture uh, for you right quick. Um, as a matter of fact, um, let me see. Let me pull up this scripture. Uh, um, watch this. I'm pulling up the scripture. When you go to, uh, this is for Tanya. Tanya questions was, um, uh, Tanya question was, then why do people say, once you're saved, you're always saved? And she's, um, um, that is her question because we were talking about suicide, uh, being forgiven of suicide, whatever. And I said, my answer is that because people don't understand what God has said. 
Now, when you go, y'all stay right there. But if you go to uh, Matthew 7 and 23, uh, this is for Tanya. If you go to Matthew 7 and 23, uh, Matthew 7 and 23 says, and, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what this is saying, this is talking to the believers. It's saying that many will say in the end, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And he's saying, depart from me, I never knew you. So if you were to take this in, in the corner, these people would consider themselves to be what? Saved. You see, they will consider themselves to be saved. However, they are not because we have to understand that it's, it's bigger than the moment that you confess because Tanya... I don't have time to go into it now, but you have to. I have a teaching on the three, um, the three phases of, of salvation. You know, from the moment that you accept Christ, you have been saved. Then you're saved daily by the Holy Spirit, and then in the end, you shall be saved. So it, there's three different tenses that that take place, and we have to understand what's going on. That's why the Bible says, "He that endured to the end shall be saved." And she could go to 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. We might want to put it on there so she'll have a record of it. Uh, Tanya, if you're still there, you can hear me. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. Okay? All right. Um, what, what was my scripture? Uh, so I hope you understand it. Okay? So what, what was the scripture I just gave out? Um, uh, Matthew 12 and 31. Um, give, me, give me 31. Read 31 for me. Therefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, say it again. It says, all manner of blasphemy unto who? All manner of sin and blasphemy. Shall be forgiven unto men. Unto men. Okay. All right. Keep going. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto but, men. But the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven. So my question is, why not Christ? Why isn't Christ included there? Because he's not God. Because he's what? But, but because he's what? Not man. Because, no. no. Don't say that. I'll come chin check you uh, over there. Why wouldn't, why is Christ's name not there? Because he's what? Nah, y'all, y'all, y'all in here, y'all not paying attention. Because he's the man. He's the man. It says that the only thing that will not be um, forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So watch this. Let's go back to this Trinity thing. Let's show you. So let me, let me make this, this hit you with this, this, this Trinity thing again. God the Father. Yes, check. God the Son? No. The Son of God. Yes. And then the Spirit of God. Because of what I want you to understand is that, see, the reason why you can't be forgiven for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is di directly from... Where does the Holy Spirit come from? From God. It comes from God. From it's directly from God. Because you have to understand that it's the spirit of God is, that is going to help you understand the things of God. Because remember, remember Christ said the Holy Spirit, the comforter is going to come and it's going to remind you of everything that I've said. So that it's all about the truth. The, so the Holy Spirit is going to point you back to the truth. So when you say that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, you're saying that you're talking directly to God saying, no God, there is no God. Y'all understand that? Does that make sense? However, if you say that Jesus, if blasphemy against Jesus, you can be forgiven for that because he was the man. Are y'all understanding? Verse, verse, look, 12 and 32. I'm sorry, I thought we had read 12 and 32. 12 and 32 says, and whosoever speaketh a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him. Mm -hmm. You see that? That's in comparison to he that speak blasphemy against the spirit of God shall not be forgiven. So speaking against the spirit of God, you cannot be forgiven. Speaking against the son of man, it shall be forgiven because Jesus was the man. You see that? But to whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Because you're saying you're talking directly to God. 
You understand that? So once again, when we go back to that Trinity, yeah, I understand the Trinity co concept. The three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, when you, like I said, Trinity is not in the Bible. It came along later that they added this and made it be the Holy Trinity. However, you need to understand that God, Son, and Spirit of God is would be the Trinity. Not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. No, because there is no God the Son. It's the Son of God, and it is the Spirit of God. I understand the God here, but it's the same thing that I just said. You see, it's not God the Son. You follow me? You see what I'm saying? There is the dual nature of Christ because he was by the Spirit of God. Created by the Spirit of God. So yes, he was 100% man, 100% God, because he wasn't born of man. You see, it was the Spirit of God that spoke him into being. Y'all follow me? I don't, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is not confusing. And these are the three that bear record of God. But remember, like I said, when I gave you the characteristics of God, God cannot be born, God cannot grow, God cannot die. Only man can be those things. That's what eliminates the, the God from him. Because once again, once he came, once he was born into the earth realm, he was no longer God. He became the man. And this is why when we get here to Matthew 12, it tells you that if you speak against that man that was born, it can still be forgiven you because you're talking about that man. However, if you speak against that spirit of God, then it will not be forgiven you because you're talking directly to God. Because God is putting the spirit in you and you're defying define everything that is within you. They have a question. Mm -hmm. Question. It says, um, what exactly is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is going to be taking the Lord's name as vain. It's going to be anything that is that is contrary to what God says. Do you understand that? And that's going to be right. blaspheming. Right. Not believing the word altogether. And that's even right. Jesus, Jesus that's said, blasphemy. Um, even if you don't believe me, believe the works that I do. That's because right. Because it comes from the Father. That's right. And somebody said they don't believe none of that. I don't believe the, uh, what you're talking about with God. I don't believe mm -hmm. That's right, because you have to understand, the Bible tells you that, see, when people say that, uh, they may say, I didn't know. But the Bible tells you that the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Even the everything that you see tells you who God is, that God is creator of all. You, you understand that? Everything that we see lets you know that we understand that um, when you, if you're involved in science, we, we understand that scientists have said that there's no such thing as anything random. Randomness does not exist. So if random does not exist, that means that everything had a purpose. It was intentionally created. When we understand the atmosphere, the, um, we understand that the atmosphere is perfect for man to live. If it was a whatever, one eye odor oath, it would be impossible for man to inhabit and live. With the gas and, and, and different things that are, that are in the atmosphere. Y'all understand it? So this means that it was intentional. Okay? Yes. Okay? So y'all understand that? Y'all with me? So, once again, and, and, and like I said, the reason for this is because the church needs to understand, until the church understands the difference between God and, and, and Jesus, they're going to be stuck. And so uh, this also says that when somebody starts talking about no Jesus or oh, Jesus is this and that, blah, blah, blah. This, guess what? You, have, you don't have to defend that. You see, because here's what happens. When we make Jesus be God, then we, we, it's displaced worship when we make him be God. See, when we go back to the pictures of Caesar Borgia, the, the, the white Jesus that's in the churches, in the homes, when you worship that image in that picture, it's displaced worship because God is not receiving that worship. You understand? The enemy is receiving that worship because he's manipulated you to worship that image. 
But what he's done, when he's manipulated you to worship that image, he's taken your, your focus away from where it should be and put it in another place. So, but when he's taken it away from where it should be on God, he's put it in another place. You're no longer worshiping God. You're worshiping the image. You're worshiping man. You're worshiping the enemy because this is a spiritual thing. You see, and this is why people are messed up because when we understand the Bible, the Bible never told you that the picture of, of, of Caesar Borgia was Christ. Who told you that? People said that. And then, hey, it just caught on. But the thing is, how many people do their due diligence and go back and research it? Because when you research Caesar Borgia, when you research the reason why it was painted, he tells you that he painted it to deceive the world. So how is it that he told you that I painted it to deceive the world and people are worshiping it and not understanding that they're deceived? You follow me? Does that make sense? So this thing, this is a spiritual battle that we are a part of. You need to understand the difference between God and, and Christ. And I know that we got coming up, we got coming up Christmas. We're going to do the study on Christmas and, and, and get into that. But we really need to understand. And let me let me explain something to people. Let me let me explain something to to people. What what is what are they saying? Um, Solana, what, what, uh, somebody had a question. What I need you to understand. Some people worship the book. Some people worship the book. Michael. Um, some people worship the book. Yeah, some people worship the book. Yeah. There are many things that you can worship. You can worship the Bible. You can worship money. You can worship your car. You can worship your, your husband or your wife. Any, your, your children, your job. Yourself. Anytime, yourself. Thank you. Anytime you're worshiping anything other than God, then there's a problem. You're in error. And people will come and say, well, ain't nothing wrong. I love my wife. Ain't nothing wrong with me, me loving my wife. It's beyond loving your wife. Because when God says something and your wife says something, then who do you listen to? And if you listen to God, I mean, your wife over God, then you're worshiping your wife. If faithfully you say that every Sunday, I get up and wash my car. I ain't got time to go to church or whatever. I got to wash my, my car on Sunday faithfully. Then you're worshiping that car. That car has become your God. Same thing with your children, whatever. We don't have to go, uh, um, um, um. Uh, Incident by incident, case by case. OK, so once again, when we get back to when we get back to Genesis 22 and 8, when Isaac asked Abraham, I see the, the wood, I see the fire. But where is the the lamb for the burnt offering? We understand that when Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. He gave you a glimpse into the future of what was happening. And this was a type for Christ, for what was coming. And we understand that when you understand what the laws, the requirements of the burnt offering was, that it had to be a lamb without blemish. And also that the, the um, how you doing? And also that the, the purpose of the burnt offering was to atone for sin. We understand that Isaac could not be the, the, the sacrifice. He did not meet the requirements. So this was a type for Christ that was coming. So when we understand when Christ came born of a virgin, he was pure. He didn't have the seed of the sin of the seed of man in him. So he was pure. He was without blemish. This is why he was able to be the ultimate sacrifice. And when he became the ultimate sacrifice, this is why everything changed. And now we have a new testament, a new covenant. Why? Because after he came, he changed everything. Now, all of a sudden, that old covenant is no longer good. Now, there's a new covenant. And this is why when the new covenant came now, since he became the great high priest, now we pray to God in the, in, in the, in the name of Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son. You see? So now we have access that under the old covenant, everybody didn't have access. That access only came with the new covenant, with Christ. When Christ was crucified and rose again, now the church is born. Now the church has access to God by way of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit came when? With the new covenant. Y'all understand that? Okay. So it shouldn't, I, I, I hope if, if there are any more questions, um, if there are any questions, 
uh, put them up. Mike's saying, which version are you reading from? I, I don't think that the, the version matters. It's about what the, uh, because the version is just a translation, uh, Mike. The version is just a translation. See, people, you know, and, and I know where you're coming from. People have to understand that um, sometimes they'll say that, okay, well, King James was this person. But King James had nothing to do with the Bible. He just put the Bible in standard English in the, uh, in the, in the, in the tongue of the day. And he organized it because before King James, there were several Bibles. So King James came and made one standard Bible in the lingo of the day. That was the purpose. That was his contribution. So that's why the King James Version was so important because of that, that thing that it did. You see, however, King James didn't write the Bible or anything like that. It already existed. Okay. So if you really want to do the history, you go to, um, you go to, um, go back to 405, 405, 409 uh, AD, and you see Jerome, the Latin Vulgate was the first Bible. That was the Old Testament and the New Testament. That was in 409. So that was, um, that was a thousand years, 1200 years before King James Version. And they had so many Bibles in between there. So that's how you, that's how you know the, the, the difference. Okay, um, so I think that's it. And are there any other questions? No other questions. So everybody with me, everybody understand what's going on. Okay. All right. So let's, let's, let's close up. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you.